Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Curtin, editor at Genome Web, and I'll be your moderator today. The title of today's webinar is Why Are Some Vaccines Effective in Some Individuals But Not in Others? and is sponsored by Lexigen. Our speaker is Peter Meisman, a postdoctoral researcher in biological data mining at the University of Antwerp. You may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look to the bottom tray of your window, there are a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Thank you. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so today we are going to talk about why some vaccines are effective in some individuals but not in others. And I'm going to talk about some of the studies that we did where we actually explored differences in vaccine responses using transcriptomic profiling. Now, the first thing that I very quickly want to point out is we need to define what a vaccine response is. Now, typically you will, when we're talking about vaccine responses, we are talking about the antibodies induced by a vac vaccination event. So this graph that I show here that I got from a, another publication uh, illustrate this nicely. So typically a naive individual will start with no IgMs, no IgG titers. After the first uh, vaccination dose, you will actually see an increase in IgMs followed by an increase in IgGs, which will then be boosted along with subsequent immunization events. So today when I'm going to be talking about why some individuals respond well to vaccines, most of the time I'm going to be talking about this from an antibody level perspective. So why do we see antibodies being induced in some individuals and not in others? Now, the two studies that I would like to present today feature uh, two different vaccines. So one is going to be a hepatitis B vaccine against, of course, the hepatitis B virus, which is a monovalent vaccine, so it only contains a single antigen. It is typically given in a three or four dose schedule and is known to have about a 90% response rate. Uh, the second vaccine is the MMR vaccine, so the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, which is a trivalent and, uh, vaccine, uh, which is often given in one or two doses, typically as a childhood vaccine uh, in, uh, in many countries. Uh, and it, the response rate actually varies between about 88% for typically the mumps component up to 98% for some of the other components. So to start with, I'm going to talk uh, first about our hepatitis B vaccination study. So this is a study which was published uh, recently in vaccine, where we actually explored transcriptomic profiles before and after the vaccination event. We tried to correlate this to the response to the actual vaccination. Uh, so a bit more details about the actual vaccine. So this is uh, a vaccine against hepatitis B, and it actually uses the hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, it is known to have about 5 to 10% uh, responders, uh, non-responders, I mean, and the known uh, risk factors. So essentially the risk factors uh, that contribute to the non-response um, are uh, age, typically also people of male gender typically have a lower response, uh, as well as genetic associations like uh, specific HLA genotypes, uh, but also things like chronic disease and uh, immunomodulatory medications, so people who are taking immunosuppressants. So this, for example, uh, is a figure that I uh, got from a publication in the Journal of Clinical Virology, uh, which clearly shows you have uh, the hepatitis B uh, response plotted out against both age. So you see as age increases, the number of non-responders goes up, as well as the clear difference between men and women. So for this uh, study, we actually recruited 34 individuals with no prior hepatitis B vaccination or disease history. Uh, 
because we wanted to exclude the possibility of the age effects uh, having an influence on the vaccine response, we recruited individuals between 21 and 50 years uh, of age. Uh, our specific experimental overview uh, shows that we uh, gave people a vaccine at day zero. So prior to giving the vaccine, we, we took our first blood sample, which I will call the day zero blood sample, uh, which was then subjected to uh, gene expression profiling, so RNA sequencing, as well as antibody titers and cell counts. Then we took a subsequent uh, blood sample at day three, which was also uh, subjected to gene expression profiling, and then a, uh, a second time point for gene expression profiling at day seven. So in total, we had three time points for our gene expression profiling. We followed the one of the standard hepatitis B schedules, where we then gave the, our volunteers a second dose at one month and a third dose at a year. Uh, we then measured the antibody titers at day 60, day 180, and day 365 to actually see how the indivi different individuals responded to the vaccine. Now, at day 60, the situation looked like this. So we started with 34 individuals. We gave all 34 individuals uh, the hepatitis B vaccine. And we saw that at uh, our day 60, we had 42% non-responders. So uh, beware, in this case, we only gave two out of the three mandatory doses for protection. Uh, in addition, this is only at day 60, and the situation does change a bit later on. But here, if we use the uh, typically defined uh, definition of protection, uh, which is an antibody titer less than 10 uh, international units, uh, we find 14 non-responders. Uh, in addition, we can actually differentiate between uh, among the responders, between our low responders, which are individuals which have an antibody titer between 10 and 100, and our strong responders, which are an antibody titer larger than 100. However, uh, the, this day 60 time point doesn't really tell the complete story, because if we actually plot out the antibody titers of both the low responders and the non-responders over the next year, we actually see that many of the non-responders at day 60 do actually increase later. So this is what's shown in this plot here, and you can actually see that uh, the, in dark, so in black, are the non-responders, and you can see that many of them by day 180 actually uh, increase their antibody titer to levels above uh, this limit of 10 international units. So in this case, they actually do respond, but they simply respond much later. Uh, this means that we can actually distinguish broadly our, um, our cohort into individuals that had a strong immediate response, individuals that they had a delayed response, and individuals that had a um, that never had a response in the year that we followed them. This was only four individuals out of the 34 that we followed, which matches nicely with this 90% uh, rate of non-responders. So uh, for the RNA sequencing itself, as I mentioned, we had three time points, uh, a day zero, day three, and a day seven. And we actually made use of the lexigan quantsec protocol on whole blood samples to actually measure the gene expression in the blood of these uh, individuals prior to vaccination and after vaccination. Now, uh, as we had 34 individuals we had, and we had three time points, we also included two repeats for every time point for every individual to create some redundancy in our data set. We had a total of 204 samples that needed to be sequenced. Now, we sequenced this on an Illumina NextSec uh, in a high, true, high output format. Um, and we wish to have sufficient reads, so that's meant that we could actually only fit 40 samples per run. So we had uh, 200 samples, um, but could only fit 40 per run. Um, and 
this was actually uh, something that we had to be extremely mindful of. Uh, and I very quickly wanted to mention today because I see far too many uh, scientific studies making mistakes against uh, uh, this sort of setup. So when you are actually analyzing these samples, and this can be irrespective if you are measuring uh, transcriptomic samples or proteomic samples or metabolomic samples, what you need to be very mindful of is how you divide your samples and uh, when you will actually be measuring specific samples. Because uh, there is a great danger of actually have introducing batch effects into uh, your samples uh, and into your measurements. So this means that those samples that are grouped together on a specific run very often tend to have uh, an error, a common error, that is typical for that specific run. So this means that to actually circumvent uh, this sort of batch effect uh, potential, you actually need to split not based on the criteria of interest, but actually divide your samples across different runs uh, and um, make sure that your different days and different responder classes are actually analyzed also in different runs. So for example, the setup that we did here, because we actually had replicates uh, for each sample, is to make sure that all of the replicates were always on a different run, uh, that all of the uh, samples from a single individual uh, for day zero, day three, and day seven were on the same run, um, so that if we were later to compare day zero, day three, and day seven, we would actually compensate for any patch effects that might be present. Uh, furthermore, we actually randomly divided all of our patients across these different runs. So, um, we did this transcriptomics experiment. So, we, like I mentioned, we used the NextSeq, uh, and we ended up between at minimum three to four million reads per sample, and at most about 10 million reads per sample, which is uh, sufficient to actually. Um, do some sort of differentially expression analysis uh, and really dig deep into the gene expression profiles that these people presented. Now, the first thing that we typically do um, when analyzing this sort of data set is we actually do a principal component analysis. Now, for those of you who are actually unfamiliar with the principal component analysis, what this is, is this actually plots out the largest sources of variation that exists within the data set. So this is actually a data projection method that will actually create a, a new variables, so-called principal components, that will try to capture any trends or, uh, or variances that you can find within the data set. Now, this is a good way to, for example, explore the batch effects that I mentioned earlier, where if you would have batch effects across your different runs, they would very often show up nicely in a principal component analysis. Uh, in addition, there might be some other effects that are common, um, such as a division uh, based on gender, based on age, uh, or even based on the condition that you are studying. Uh, in our case, um, this was the result. So we actually had these 200 samples. And if we plotted them out um, based on this uh, principal component analysis, we see that we have a nice big blob of uh, points, which is actually what we want. So this means that there is no real uh, batch effect going on. There is no real division. We see that um, the time points are mixed in together. So day zero, day three, and day seven, there is no player separation there, as well as there's no player separation between the types of responder classes. Uh, what we did see, what you cannot see on this plot, unfortunately, is that uh, samples from the same individual tended to group together. Uh, which makes sense. So this means that the largest source of variation in gene expression when me measuring blood is, of course, individual specific. So then we performed a standard uh, differential expression analysis. So we used the uh, DESEC uh, to uh, R library to do this uh, analysis. And the first question that we wanted to ask was, uh, how does actually the gene expression change in response to the vaccine? Uh, so in this case, do we actually see any differences in the gene expression profiles after we give the vaccine? And we actually ran this analysis for both the responders and non-responders as defined by day 60 
Uh, and we actually did see uh, quite a bit of difference in the sense, as you can see in this table over here, that uh, for the responders, we actually found the most differentially expressed genes in our comparison of day three versus day zero. Uh, however, for the non-responders, which of course included many of these delayed or slow responders, we found more differential express genes at the day seven mark. Uh, so this does actually um, correlate nicely with what we see for the antibody titers. Uh, in addition, many of the differentially expressed genes, and I'm not going to list all uh, 500 years, uh, were actually associated with the immune system. So these were a mix of uh, different genes that you could associate either with the innate or the adaptive immune system. Uh, what we could do, uh, the, the, the nice overview that I do want to give you here, is for example for the responder genes. So here we have the differentially expressed genes of day three versus day zero, and we actually overlay them in the protein-protein interaction network. So remember, these were about 300 genes that were differentially expressed for the responder class. Um, they are colored on this little network that's a bit hard to read. Uh, but many of these genes are related to T and B cell immunity. Uh, however, they proved a bit too little to uh, do a standard gene ontology enrichment analysis on, uh, also given the fact that many of these genes do not have any annotations. Therefore, we actually use the MILES tool, which actually is able to uh, calculate enrichments based on the protein-protein interaction network. So it's actually able to propagate um, patterns that exist within the protein-protein interaction network to actually create a more informative uh, enrichment analysis that can take into account even those genes that have no annotation themselves. Now, I'm not sure if you can actually read the, the, the slide specifically here, but suffice to say, so we do find several enriched subgraphs according to this MILES program. Uh, the first was related to uh, the, the activation of leukocytes. So these are typically your T and B cells. The other one uh, shows, so the one at the bottom shows that we actually had several genes which had no known annotation, uh, which is quite common if you're doing analysis on, on pretty much any kind of uh, organism these days. Even the human uh, genome has um, substantial amounts of genes that are unfortunately still not annotated. Uh, but in this case, we were able to show with this, with this program that these genes were strongly related to both the innate response, so the innate immune response, and actually the regulation of the adaptive uh, immune, immune response. Um, however, we didn't find any specifically related to antibody production, which of course might make sense given that we're only at day three at this point. Uh, this is a bit different for our day seven uh, measurements. Of course, it's for our non-responders, where again, we find uh, upregulation of T-cell uh, mediated immunity, leukocyte activation, and lymphocyte co-stimulation genes. Okay, so this is kind of like, what does the gene expression do in response to the vaccine. However, this doesn't really answer us the question like, why do we have a difference between responders and non-responders, given that these individuals are all about the same age and we didn't really see uh, any big differences between male and female individuals. So we actually compared the differential expression between our responder class and our non-responder class at each time point. And the most interesting thing that we found here was actually that the biggest difference could be seen, so the most differentially expressed genes could be found at day zero. So there we actually found 23 genes that were actually differentially expressed between our responders and non-responders. So it actually means that the biggest difference uh, in gene expression could be seen before the vaccination event. Now, this is uh, something that others have noted before, uh, that it seems to be the case that there are signals in the gene expression that uh, correlate with vaccine, with vaccine response prior to even giving the vaccine. So this is a, a quick heat map overview of uh, these uh, genes, where we have the non-responders at the top, the low and the high responders at the bottom. Uh, and so you can see that there's a, a clear set of genes that are upregulated in our non-responders and a set of genes that are upregulated 
in our low and high responders. Again, we can kind of overlay them in this protein-protein interaction network. And I'd like to quickly call attention to two genes that, uh, that are quite relevant. So the first gene that we found actually um, related to our non-responders was uh, the granulin gene, uh, which is, of course, uh, associated with our granulocytes. Uh, and the other gene, which is, of course, also an interaction partner of the, the granulin protein, is the uh, CXCL5 uh, cytokine. So these both play an important role in inflammation and host immune defense. Uh, in addition, the fact that we see this upregulation of uh, granulin actually led us to assume that there would also be something to be seen at the level of granulocytes. So we actually checked our uh, cell count data, and indeed, our non-responders had a higher percentage of uh, granulocytes. Uh, so this is quite interesting in the sense that um, this finding seems to be somehow associated with the eventual uh, vaccine response. Uh, furthermore, this kind of begs the question, if uh, we do see this difference between uh, responders and non-responders, and we see this prior to even giving the vaccine, can we actually somehow make a uh, prediction model, a prediction tool uh, that can actually predict if someone will respond to a vaccination, yes or no? And so to do this, we actually um, used a machine learning model. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the particularities of machine learning, this is simply a uh, model which will create in abstract a decision boundary in our multidimensional space created by our different uh, gene counts. So for example, imagine that we only had uh, two genes that we were measuring here, and we had our uh, non-responders and, uh, and our responders that we wanted to distinguish. We would create a decision boundary, for example, that looks like this, this red dotted line, which would then separate our non-responders and our responders, which we could then use later on to classify any other unknown sample if they were going to be responders, yes or no. However, in this case, we do have um, many more genes than samples, which means that we have more features than samples, so this is a big danger for overfitting. For those of you who are familiar with machine learning, uh, in addition, we can't really use all of the earlier gene differential gene expression due to uh, the potential for information bleed because we are actually doing cross-validation analyses. Um, and for this reason, we actually make use very often of feature reduction methods so that we can actually transform down our uh, gene expression features, which are defined by our genes, into smaller amounts of features, which can then be used to create a prediction model. So there's actually three specific classes. You can have your automatic feature selection, which can be a simple differential gene expression analysis. Uh, there's also the module-based uh, aggregation methods, which actually use gene sets. Uh, in addition, you also have your projection-based uh, feature aggregation methods, such as your principal component analysis that I introduced before. So uh, for this specific study, we actually used the latter. So we actually used our uh, principal component analysis to actually transform down um, our uh, gene sets into a smaller amount of principal components. So we actually used that to build a classifier, which we then validated using a leave on out cross-validation analysis. Uh, and so the, the goal of this classifier is to uh, see if we can actually predict who will respond yes or no prior to vaccination. Uh, and what you see here is a, a typical uh, receiver operating characteristic curve or an RFC curve, uh, which shows that um, while our performance isn't great, because of course our sample size is still quite small, it is, um, however, uh, above the random line. In fact, uh, you can actually see that with a, quite a high specificity, so with almost no false positives, we are able to identify about 30% of the true positives. All right, so this was um, for the hepatitis uh, B vaccine. So as I mentioned before, this is a simple monovalent vaccine. Um, which we gave to naive individuals, so individuals without any prior exposure. So our next uh, step was if we could do something similar for a more complex setup, 
And so for this, we actually looked at the MMR vaccine. So this is a mix of three live attenuated vaccines. Um, and uh, are actually used mostly for, for childhood doses. So this actually means that most individuals have received this vaccine, at least in Western countries. Uh, however, there is some interest in actually um, studying this vaccine still, because of course there are recent outbreaks of measles, mumps, and rubella um, due to the high prevalence of non-vaccinated children or individuals. However, even vaccinated individuals aren't fully protected, as it's known that um, in these outbreaks, often we see about 10% of individuals getting sick that have gotten the vaccine. So that actually kind of um, um, shows that while the vaccine offers substantial protection, it is not able to, pr to protect every single individual. So there is quite some interest in understanding why we are still missing some individuals with this vaccine. Now, of course, because this is a mix of three uh, antigens, we actually have three separate antibody titers. Uh, in addition, um, because most individuals have had this vaccine, we also changed our study setup to not uh, focus on naive individuals, but actually look at individuals that have already had, had a prior MMR vaccination. So we actually recruited 40 adults, so between 20 to 30 years old, that had a history of MMR uh, uh, vaccination um, and simply gave them the vaccine and then measured their transcriptomic profiles. However, um, this study already was a bit complicated due to the fact that the MMR history of these uh, volunteers already differed substantially. Uh, you see that because it's not a fully mandatory vaccine, uh, there are some variations possible. Uh, so some individuals have gotten the full two doses, while all the others have only received one dose or date unknown, but positive antibody titers were detected. Um, so as I mentioned before, this is a very similar setup to what I showed you already for the hepatitis B vaccine, where we uh, vaccinated individuals, took a sample prior to the vaccination and then the day three and day seven, and measured the antibody titers at later dates. However, um, there is a, a further complication in the fact that there is no strict clinical definition for protection threshold for MMR antibody titers. Remember before, for hepatitis B, we had this standard 10 international units. No such clinical definition exists, unfortunately, for MMR. In addition, this is an additional shot um, of already vaccinated individuals. So we have to ask the question, how are we going to define vaccine response? We actually have to consider both the pre-vaccination immunity, so some individuals already had antibody titers prior to being given this additional shot, and we have to consider the post-vaccination immunity. So we actually uh, saw that you could broadly divide our volunteers into four different groups. We had individuals that had a high antibody titer both before and after vaccination, we had volunteers that had a low antibody titer before and after vaccination. Then we had uh, individuals that had what we would call a long response, which had no anti antibody titers or low antibody titers prior to being given this additional shot, but then had a uh, boost um, after the vaccine that kind of stayed high. And then we had those individuals with a peak response, so which had a short burst of antibody titers at day 21. So this is just a simple heat map representation of what I showed you before. Um, so we had a number of individuals, specifically here for measles, that had a high antibody titer to the left, so all in red, then low antibody titer on blue, and then the mixed long and peak response types. Um, uh, an additional complication, and this has already been noted before, uh, but we were able to confirm it in our study as well, is that response types were actually independent between different antigen components. It's not because you had a good antibody titer against measles that you also had a good antibody titer against mumps or rubella. So we actually saw a mix of different responses between the different individuals um, without any strict relation or pattern. So that meant that 
um, there were actually uh, four response types for the three components, and um, pretty much any combination was possible. So the, what we first looked uh, at was a uh, time comparison per response group. Um, so I'm just going to summarize these results here to not go into detail on every single gene that we found. But what we saw is that for the high antibody titers and the low antibody titers, so those individuals for which the, um, the vaccination event did not seem to change the antibody titers too much, we didn't find too many differentially expressed genes. And those that we did find were, not, uh, were often not related to the immune system. However, for the response classes of the long response or the peak response, so those individuals who had a clear increase in antibody titers after the vaccination event, we found many more differentially expressed genes and many were uh, indeed immune relevant. Uh, in addition, if we then actually compare the different response classes, uh, so remember these response classes, of course, were different for the different antigen antigens. So um, this already complicates any kind of um, analysis that we can do here. However, we will still be able to pick up um, a small signal um, among some of the antigens. For example, for measles, we saw that um, the low antibody titers versus the uh, non-low antibody titer groups. So we also always compared one response group against all of the other individuals in the study. Uh, we found several uh, genes related to, um, to interferon. Uh, in addition, the long response and the peak response, uh, we found several um, defense uh, genes uh, related to, of course, uh, neutrophils. So again, we see something that is related to the presence, presence of granulocytes that is somehow uh, influencing or as a result of uh, the vaccination event. So in this case, also we found the most differentially expressed genes after the vaccination at day seven. All right, so um, to very quickly come to a few conclusions uh, about this year. Um, so I showed you the hepatitis B vaccine, vaccine study, and there we saw that uh, quite clearly the baseline gene expression does seem to correlate with the naive monovalent vaccination, uh, and that there seems to be a role for the innate immune system prior to vaccination. So this has been observed in several other studies that there seems to be a kind of um, um, prerequisite for certain states in the innate immune system to have a good subsequent uh, immune response. However, if you consider then things like uh, trivalent vaccines, which consist of different antigens, and you see that there is a difference in um, the response that you get for the different antigenic components, this of course cannot be the result anymore of a single signal in the innate immune system. So therefore, this actually does uh, indicate a role um, as expected for the adaptive immune system. Um, also prior to the vac vaccination, uh, which can either be at the genetic basis or at the T or B cell basis, uh, which then influences somehow um, response to the different antigenic components. So this actually means that um, the question of why are, um, so are vaccines effective in some individuals and not in others seems to be uh, that this is a combination between things in the innate immune system as well as the immu adaptive immune system operating in concert. So I would also like to very quickly um, um, end with a few takeaways that I hope you've kind of picked up uh, during this presentation. Uh, so I do want to emphasize again that to be very mindful of designing gene expression experiments as batch effects can unfortunately lead to very inaccurate results. Uh, in addition, the definition of response classes for vaccines are still a non-trivial problem, especially given that I've always talked about here just antibody titers, which is of course not the entire story. This is simply an associate. This is a, um, a, a measure that is simply easy to measure, uh, that is often used to define these response responses to vaccines. But of course, they do not tell the uh, entire story because we also need to look at 
uh, the actual uh, T cell response, B cell response, and innate response. Um, in addition, of course, the, the, the peak gene expression response, of course, varies between vaccines and responder types. So when you're actually designing these studies and actually choosing what time points to include, um, it is often difficult because different individuals will actually have the best response at different times. Um, in addition, it is actually quite possible to actually use this kind of gene expression data to actually create um, somewhat performant prediction tools, but only if there is a signal to be found. For example, for the MMR uh, study where we had this very low signal, of course, due to the fact that we have different antigens, um, this is severely complicated um, and uh, a predictor is likely impossible without either much more samples or um, a much stronger signal boost. So um, the work that they presented here was, of course, not the effort of, of one single individual, um, but of uh, several um, research groups at the University of Antwerp that came together in a multidisciplinary consortium, which we call the Audakis Consortium. Um, and specifically, the work that I presented here was actually the work of three PhD students that have since uh, actually all successfully graduated their PhDs and have all become doctors now. So these were Dr. Uh, Esther Bartholomeus, Dr. George Elias, and Dr. Nicolas de Neuter. And that is all that I uh, wanted to talk about for uh, today. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Peter, for this very clear presentation. It was really enjoyable to listen to you. Um, and now to give Peter a few minutes before we go to the Q&A session, I want to briefly mention QuantSeq. As described, uh, Peter and his colleagues have used QuantSeq in this research to assess gene expression profiles of the study participants. So QuantSeq was particularly useful for this purpose because it enables a fast and easy access to gene expression profiles. In contrast to common mRNA-seq methods, QuantSeq generates only one fragment per transcript at the very three prime end. Con uh, consequently, much fewer reads are required per sample to get meaningful gene expression data. This enables a higher level of multiplexing. And also this workflow of QuantSeq is fast and easy and the downstream data analysis is particularly straightforward because you only have to count the fragments that you have sequenced in the RNA sequencing one instead of assembly and calculating FPKMs to get the gene expression data from whole transcriptome data. So these factors combined make QuantSeq a very cost efficient method. Further, QuantSeq is a fast and robust protocol. It consists of only five major steps and no pre-processing -process, pre is required, such as mRNA selection or ribosomal RNA depletion. This additionally saves time and consumables in your workflow. And if you ever end up to have larger screening projects where you want to assess gene expression profiles, we also offer QuantSeq pool in QuantSeq pool, you can pool up to 96 samples into one reaction after the very first step of the library preparation. This means you can uh, pool your samples and process your samples in batch in only one reaction. And this saves time and consumables and also enables the manual processing of large sample numbers in parallel. So if you are interested in QuantSeq or QuantSeq Pool or other Lexigen products, please contact support at lexigen.com if you want to consult about your project or directly get an introductory offer from sales at lexigen.com or visit our QuantSeq intro page. And with that, I want to open the stage for the Q&A session and hand back over to Chiara. Thank you, Martina. We just heard from Martina Sauert, a product manager at Lexigen. As a reminder, to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'd like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey to give us your feedback. We will now start with the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is, uh, Peter, you mentioned that the gene expression signals relate to the innate immune system, but is there also a role for the adoptive immune system? And how would you measure that? And could a similar prediction model be built? <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you. That's an excellent question. So as I mentioned, uh, what we were able to study here using the gene expression profiling was, of course, restricted to mostly the innate immune system because there you see the strongest signals. Uh, but there is a very clearly a role for the adaptive immune system as well. And uh, these sort of things can actually be measured um, or actually quantified using either uh, T-cell sequencing or T-cell receptor sequencing or B-cell receptor sequencing technologies. We are actually currently uh, in the process of wrapping up several studies where we're actually using this technology and trying to um, uh, place this alongside of the things that we've seen in the gene expression profiles. And we actually see um, that there is indeed this dual role of both the innate and the adaptive uh, immune system. And how does gene expression from early time points, such as like day three, from hepatitis B vaccination predict antibody titer? Um, so the, the question, if I understand correctly, is um, if the I, okay if the gene expression profiles do actually correlate at day three even with the antibody titer. Mm -hmm. It actually seems to be the case that it doesn't seem to be a strong correlate as much as we found on the day zero. So that means that after the vaccine is given, the the the, the vaccine responses kind of uh, or the gene expression profiles actually kind of start converging a bit more, or at least become a bit more troubled, so that less of a signal can be picked up. Uh, so that's why, as I mentioned, um, we saw that the biggest gene expression differences were actually on day zero prior to the vaccination, which is a bit actually counterintuitive, but uh, our study is not the only study that has noticed this uh, at the moment. And did you take into consideration the adjuvants used for these vaccines? Uh, no, not specifically. Um, we mostly focused on uh, these vaccines, so the hepatitis B vaccine and the MMR vaccine, as the most one of the most common variants that is currently used in in medical practice. So, um, indeed, um, if we had a larger uh, sample of different vaccines, of course, many do contain different adjuvants. There is very likely a role of the adjuvants. Um, with respect to how they will then define um, responders and non-responders. Um, did you do a covariate correction on individual ID before calculating differential expression? Uh, yes, so we're actually able to uh, actually introduce the different individuals as a uh, covariate factor uh, in the analysis which actually boosted the signal that we were able to get. Um, are the gene expression signals you described universal for all vaccines? Um, what is known about the current COVID vaccines, uh, for example? Yeah, uh, so that's also a very good question. Um, so what we found is that there were clear signals, um, and we could also relate to the granular sites. Um, there were there have been some excellent reviews which actually summarized different studies um, where they actually correlated gene expression to vaccine response. And what was actually found there is that you see quite a big difference. And this also comes back to the question that was posed before about the adjuvant. So very likely the type of vaccine that is used and the type of adjuvant that is used has uh, just changed the type of people that will respond. So you actually do see quite a big difference um, between genes that are associated or gene expression profiles that are associated with different uh, vaccines. Um, and what is the underlying cause of the slow responder group? How is it that some individuals only produce antibodies months after administration of vaccine? Yeah. Um, so this is a, a very complex uh, case. And again, this is something that has been noted in the past and for which we don't really have a clear answer at the moment. Uh, this also comes back a bit to something that I mentioned in, in the talk, that of course we're measuring the antibody response, uh, which of course doesn't really tell the full picture of uh, protection provided by a vaccine. This is simply a uh, measurement that some, is somehow associated with vaccine response, but it's not the full vaccine response. So it may might be that there is uh, some other uh, events going on within the immune system that we simply did not measure. In addition, um, what we also see, of course, with, with the COVID vaccines is um, that uh, there is this 
it makes sense that we're not always producing antibodies against every single thing all the time. So very often our immune system will only start producing antibodies or should only start producing antibodies when there is a pathogen uh, present. Uh, so the fact that we do see this baseline antibody uh, titer uh, might be more of an exception rather than a rule. Um, and did non-responders start with a low, with, excuse me, did non-responders start with a lower antibody titer at day zero? Yeah, so for specifically for the, the hepatitis B study, mm -hmm. um, all of our volunteers had an, uh, a, pretty much an antibody titer of zero prior to giving the vaccine. So we specifically actually selected our volunteers as a criterion to have absolutely no antibody titer. So in that case, both the responders and the non-responders had um, no antibody titers at day zero. Uh, for, of course, the MMR vaccine, the situation is much more complicated. We, of course, you have these different responder classes. Um, but in general, I don't think we saw any individuals which had, which had an absolutely zero antibody titers. Okay. Let's see. That, that looks like all the questions that have come in for you. Um... So I, I guess we will wrap it up there. Uh, we'd like to thank Peter, Martina, and our sponsor, Lexigen. Um, as a reminder, uh, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. And if you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for, the, for this genome webinar.